Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Even Stevens Ranked Podcast, the podcast for all things Even Stevens. I'm Brittany Butler. I'm Ethan Brim. And today is a very, very uh, special episode. This is our very first cast and crew interview, uh, and we are so excited and honored, honestly, to have with us today the creator of Even Stevens, Mr. Matt Dearborn. How are you today? I'm doing very, very well. It's a Saturday, and so um, it's a wide open day, wide open (laughs) for things like podcasts and stuff. (laughs) Yay. Um, So in addition to creating the show, uh, you also directed and wrote uh, a few classic episodes uh, like The Kiss, A Week First Week, and Stevens Manor, just to name a few. Uh, And you've also worked on a lot of other shows that most of us probably grew up watching. Oh, yeah. The Secret World of Alex Mack and Phil of the Future, at least according to your IMDb, that's what it says. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they're not they're not lying. That's 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 my background. I uh uh yeah, all of those shows that's uh just go on the worldwide internet and you can find out all of the uh you know, my history. Well just even some things I would wouldn't mind taking off. But <laughs> IMTV is a little like you know, the Mormon church, they never forget. <laughs> Sometimes you have credits that you feel like, God, I wish they would take that off there, but that's what happens that's great (laughs) so yeah and you're also currently working on a new series for the Disney Channel correct Um, called Fastlane yeah it's called Fastlane it was originally the uh, sort of at one time it was Disney wanted to revamp uh, Herbie the Love Bug then through some testing and some other ideas um, they just started to start with a clean slate they brought in a young writer named Travis Braun and then uh, a guy I worked with on, uh, uh, who I met on Even Stevens, Tom Burkhart, <laughs> and I came in uh, and uh, sort of ran the show for the first season, and we're getting underway to do a second season now. Awesome. Yeah, so it's called Fast Lane. It has, it's basically a talking car <laughs> and a girl, so as it relates to Her- Herbie the Love Bug, there's that, you know, kind of... Other than four, four tires, there's really not much similarity. I kind of want to just jump into some questions about you, really. Um, so, oh, Ethan, why don't you take this one? Sorry. Okay, no, that's okay. Uh, well, for me, even Stevens, I was it was my, it's my favorite show of all time. When it came out, like time stopped for me. It was I was obsessed. I thought about it nonstop. And uh, I was just wondering if there are any shows like that for you growing up that maybe even uh, inspired stuff you worked on now or, or back then in your career or, or what kind of got you into that? Well, I mean, certainly there were TV shows that were seminal events for me, um, but they weren't. Uh, it was a little different because I'm a, a tad older than you guys. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I would say... Uh, so there, like, whereas even Stevens, I'm, I'm imagining that it's was about kids roughly your age. We didn't really. It, it, I, I found myself as, as a sort of 10, 11, 12 year old being drawn to um, things like Hogan's Heroes and Wild Wild West and sort of the syndicated. Th- these were the shows that would, in any market, would come on at three or four in the afternoon. So you sort of roll home from school and. Uh, not do your homework and watch these these kind of shows. So it was, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mikhail's Navy and and uh, sort of the like the old school super broad sitcoms. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but yeah, you just uh, you just climb into those shows and just sort of live in it. So what what did you like? What did, so on even Stevens? What did you find like particularly mesmerizing? Uh, well, personally, I, I, I'm an only child, so uh, I mean, I grew up with TV uh, very heavily. With even Stevens, when I watched it, I felt like it was almost made for me, like directly for me, like in a weird way, you know? I, I really connected with Lewis. Uh, even I mean, I actually named my son after Lewis. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> he's, he's six months old. He's in the other room. Yeah. And, and uh, I told my wife, I was like, I, I think Lewis is the name. If I could choose a name, that would be the name because he meant so much to me in my life, you know, gave me like a friend when I needed one, you know, and someone who I could look to and uh, I could look up to. And he was someone who didn't really 
who was trying to find his place in the world and in his family, and uh, I, w- I could relate to that, you know? So that's what it meant to me. Yeah, he was kind of a... He was kind of a lonely character within his own family because everybody else had their crap together and, and yeah. sort of, you know, trying to figure it out. Yeah, I could see him being tremendously relatable to to boys that age. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, there's some interesting. It's interesting. You're an only child, and then there's the family dynamics of that yeah. series. But he was kind of an only child within that little universe. And I remember one of the early development meetings they were saying let's get uh rid of donnie we don't need him and i was like no i don't think so because i think if it's just it it throws too much focus on the brother and sister of it all and that becomes a different show to me this is about everywhere this kid turns there's someone kicking ass at their respective uh thing and uh whether it's you know the mom dad ran of course uh, and so that was a it was a it was a conscious component of the show to make him feel somewhat isolated. Huh. Hmm. It's very interesting. So interesting. What and uh, for me, like also, it was kind of the humor too was was very much along the lines of what I always thought was funny, and I know Brittany was oh, yeah. interested <laughs> in like the style of humor in the show, but um, yeah, that was another thing for me as well. It was just kind of surrealistic, and I don't know if, how how you would kind of describe that but well it was the original pilot i wrote for um the series wasn't quite as uh broad it wasn't quite as sensationalistic and then when they hired um uh, dennis and mark uh mark warren and dennis rinsler they sort of brought an element that was uh, uh, the sort of a joke of all a joke above all costs kind of thing i mean we still maintained heart and story and stuff mm-hmm. like that but they really they really sort of turned my head around on the tone um, okay. I, I think you remember there were some early episodes the first six that was under a different watch that was eric van Lowe mm-hmm. and company mm-hmm. and the tone the tone was a little looser Yep. Yeah. I, I I don't I don't know how else to describe it, but the, uh, Eric and and that crew, great writers, but I think it really sort of coming together with this sort of new vision of uh, in the second sort of the second thing. We we stopped after the first six and sort of retooled the 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 idea. Okay. I have like two questions related to that then. Um, so first is, it was originally titled Spivey's Kid Brother, right? Yeah. Um, so what was that all about? And when did it change to Even Stevens and why? It was originally called Spivey's Kid Brother because I thought it, first of all, I always liked that Alan Sherman so- song, uh, Hello Mother, Hello Father, I hear oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Frankie and Bernada. Some, some, there's a line about Spivey. But anyway, uh, 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 Spivey's Kid Brother to me kind of played into that what I was speaking about earlier about what if you're, you're this kid and people, everyone knows you, but they always know you in relation to somebody else in your family that's actually winning in life. Mm-hmm. So you're just like, he's, oh, that's, that's, uh, Don, Donnie Spivey's kid brother. That's Ren Steve, or sorry. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, so that was the idea. Um, and it, so it changed just for, for a couple of reasons, uh, it was a, a Disney thing, and then uh, it just, whatever, they didn't like the title, um, so that not a big deal. But then also, I think it, when we shot the pilot, it was so clear that Ren was a dynamic actress that we had to exploit, that we should sort of, you know, make it even Stevens, and I don't know if you remember the first poster, but... It was the two of them split screen. Lewis was hanging yep. upside down, and, and uh, yeah. so it was kind of it was super equal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. This is so interesting. This is so interesting. So it's like it, this is this is going in a bunch of different directions. I tried to write out an outline, but we're like going all over the place. <laughs> I just keep them coming because, to be honest with you, I uh, sometimes I get a little. You know, I've had eight, eight espressos, as you can see here. <laughs> no, no, but it's great. It's it's fantastic. So that kind of leads into these two questions here, uh, which going back to like the tone. Uh, and you saying like Disney not liking the original title. So 
the writing was really smart. Uh, it was it was witty. It was, in my opinion, I don't want to like put any other shows down, but it was a little better than like your average like quote unquote kids show. Um, so, did you always intend for it to be a kids show? And like, what was the overall goal? And did you want it to be on a major network? Like, how did it, like, what was the journey to get to Disney? Uh, the journey was, I wrote a pilot for the Disney Channel specifically. Um, it was kind of a, you know, I had been working in our dramas for about 15 years. And our dramas sort of fall in and out of favor. Sometimes you have more cop shows. Sometimes you have what we call procedurals, cop and, and, and hospital shows. Then you have more uh, what you'd call uh, ensemble drama, like families and Northern Exposure and stuff like that. So we were sort of in a world in 1999-2000 where it was heavily like, and I don't write cop or hospital shows, so I had to do something. And so I, I met this guy, Lee Gaither, at a, uh, a, the NAPP convention, convention. Why I was there is a, another matter. I was New Orleans, and I just happened to be, like, down there messing around. And he's like, you know, at, like, 1 in the morning, we're sitting, I run into him at some bar, and he's like, yeah, you should write a pilot for us. I'm like, sure. And uh, <laughs> so I, I was like, you know, I knew I was going to need the work, so I wrote a um, – uh, wrote the pilot and um, what's the back end of your question? Well, part of it was um, about the writing being like really um, smart. Yeah. I mean, I consider my best quality, my immaturity, but I also know that having had kids that like, I, I feel like a lot of writers fail in kids TV when they try to write for kids because mm -hmm. they think they have to sort of turn off part of their personality. And really you don't. Uh, to, for me, the secret to writing kids has always been how unbelievable, this is going to sound weird, but how unbelievably selfish and self-serving they are. That when they want something, they go to great lengths to, to get it. And in many ways, they can be even more devious than adults. So you, sh you don't need to soften their motivations. Right. And I yeah. think, and then, so as you're working through a script, you just write it. You know, you don't, you don't worry about, does this sound like a 12 year old boy? Um, you know, so the first pass is always just, just writing this drama slash comedy, just trying to put, hold together the best story possible. And then you get a room of, you know, smart, funny people in there. And if you have a rock solid story, which I think most of them on even Stevens were, mm -hmm. jokes come easy. The jokes yeah. really do. Um, and then just one other side note about the humor. And, uh, you know, if any writer tells you otherwise, they're lying. It's like you can write the crap out of a, a, a scene or a joke and stuff, but if you don't have funny actors to deliver that thing, and I think we, everybody in this room or this virtual room understand that Shia LaBeouf is a incredibly gifted comic performing. Yes. That's some next level stuff right there. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so having him saying those words is really, what I think, put it that, I mean, it's kind of why we're on a podcast today. Yep. <laughs> yeah, honestly. And we talk about we talk about that all the time, just how uh, he makes so like he makes these lines work where even though they're funny lines, but just the way he delivers it wouldn't have been maybe how another actor would have delivered it. And mm -hmm. it, it's what makes them so memorable. Um, on top of the fact that they're just really well-written jokes. But, like, how much was ad-libbed as far as um, the jokes and the humor? Was there a lot ad-libbed or not a lot? Not really. There was not. I mean, I've been on sets and worked on shows where you're going down to the set with 15 alternate lines, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to, to see if you can carve out, a, you know, a little more comedy from an actor or a scene or something. But for the most part, uh, it was... It was as scripted. Oh, yeah. See, that's funny, because I've seen some interviews with Shia where he's like, that whole show was ad-libbed. I was like, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> well, he may have thought, you know, he had a very he had a very casual approach. Like, mm -hmm. it's his own approach. I mean, I know he's a lot more intense now. and, and um, But, you know, that's, I mean, that's a whole other matter about kids and television and stuff like that. That's a lot of responsibility 
to put on a kid. So he, you know, the fact that he, he was a bit of a savant, you know, mm-hmm. he, he would just sort of roll out there and he was never really, uh, great at memorizing lines, but he would, we would always end up getting the scene in a way. So it was a little bit of a roller coaster each day of shooting. Mm-hmm. So that kind of brings it back to what about the audition process? Like, what do you remember from that? Um, like, what were you looking for for the character of Lewis, like, specifically? And then when Shia came in, did it become a different thing? And you were like, oh, like, we're going to... Like, did you... I have so many questions. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, guess I guess we'll, we'll start there. <laughs> Joey Paul was the casting director. I, you know, I was sitting in the room. Um, Disney executives were there, too. I believe Sean and David were there. Uh, the producers, uh, the mm-hmm. physical production guys. And uh, to her credit, Shia was the very, very first person that auditioned uh, on that day. And I think we probably met about, oh, three or four more afternoons looking. So we probably saw, I don't know, let's just say 50, for lack of a better, maybe 75 kids. But invariably, you, and this has happened in the, uh, subsequently is the casting director is pretty smart. So she's going to, you know, the, one of the first couple of people you'll meet is her best choice. And so Joey was right. We, we went around and around and there were some other contenders that, um, you know, that were like, I mean, so Shia had this sort of really laid back, relaxed vibe. And you're sort of wondering like, you know, there's going to be 80, adults with their livelihoods in this kid's hands, can he handle, you know, delivering on cue, on time, getting to work, all this kind of stuff. And there was a couple of other actors, young actors, whose names escape me at the moment, who were a little more like, walk in, hit the mark, deliver the lines perfectly. You said, thank you, and marched out. And you're going, okay, well, that's that's a safe choice. <laughs> and, then, and in the end, you just go, who made you laugh? Who were you yeah. laughing at? Who did you want to hang out with? And it was like, it was no no uh, no contest. I guess you, you've read some interviews with Shire or something, but I don't know if this has ever come out. But he was, I don't know if he did it as a tactic or as just who he is, but so on the final callbacks when there's like three or four kids waiting to see who's going to become Lewis Stevens, they're all studying their lines, but he was going... He was going up to each one and shaking their hands and wishing them luck and saying, like, hey, I got a good feeling about this for you and stuff like that. And so anyway. That's great. Yeah, he, he always said that he went out and told all the other kids that he already got the part. Oh, that, 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 that's the story that, that he says all the time, yeah. Okay, okay. Were, did, were the characters inspired by uh, anyone in particular in your own life or...? Or in anyone else's lives? Well, I mean, as weird as this sounds, I mean, I think only Lewis was sort of, I was a super low expectating, low achieving, terrible, uh, I wasn't a troublemaker. I had a good heart, but I was just, you know, my, my entire report card from kindergarten to high school was littered with, you know, C minuses and C's and you know I got a B minus it was like something to throw a party over <laughs> and it was it was um, and there was a lot of daydreaming and there was a lot of jacking around and a lot of you know just doing anything other than what I should be doing mm-hmm. as far as this as far as the rest of it a little different where did the name Lewis come from just curious because my son's named that Shoot. You know what? I may have to get back to you on that. All right. Sure. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like I feel compelled to come up with this really school, cool story to no, yeah. tell your son, like, no, it's not more than just a character on television. It's actually a, a heroic general from World War II. <laughs> I always maybe thought it was like Louis Tully from, or something like that from the Ghostbusters or... I don't. I didn't, I always just wondered what it was from, but that's all right. I can assure you, it's not that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. So let's see what else is on here. Oh, I. This is kind of uh, specific about kind of like the production order because I I noticed that some of the um, episodes were filmed. I mean, I know it's like a TV thing to film stuff 
certain episodes out of order and then uh, picking the production order. But you guys did uh, swap.com for the, was like the official pilot or the, uh, like the first episode. What, what was, was there like a choice behind that as opposed to uh, like Steven's jeans, which was filmed first or anything like that? Here's the deal. As I recall, it was, so the, as I mentioned to you earlier, the pilot I wrote was, it was a, it was, lighter on the comedy and more on the emotion is this is the one that the one where they sit in the um the ferris wheel Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah. what you're seeing is so all of that remembering reminiscing it was strictly a uh how are we going to use the pilot Mm -hmm. in a modern how are we going to because we didn't want to air the pilot as scripted because it was a lot more interpersonal mother father son you know, hmm. thing. So we did want to, but we there was a lot of usable footage and scenes, and I think it it actually um, worked well as sort of setting up what that dynamic was at school and stuff like that. So yeah. all we did was like, what's the cheapest way to get them to queue up the tee up those scenes that then we could cut back to? So we're saying, okay, well, you can get them stuck on a on a Ferris wheel. So they're just sitting there. So then at that point, it's just a lock off camera and you're just shooting. So you could basically shoot that pilot in one day. You could shoot mm-hmm. that episode in one day. Cause all you're really shooting is the two of them sitting together side by side. Yeah. But I guess then, yeah. But as far as like the episodes airing out of order, for an example, um, in the second season, the BB Mac episode was the first episode for the season. And then we see Nelson in that episode. And then like, five or six episodes later, we get Nelson's actual introduction uh-huh. episode. So like, like who, like why, <laughs> like why did that happen? You know, to be honest with you, making a television show from our end of it is so, um, all encompassing mm-hmm. that, um, once you deliver the episodes, you're like, you, I know over the network, they have tons of highly trained experts on programming and air things. And for whatever mm-hmm. reason, they just felt like whatever. Well, I, I don't know if it was a mistake uh, or okay. whatever, but I, it was certainly, I, I had nothing to do with that decision. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you really, I figured, I figured, yeah. I'm just hearing it now for the first time. <laughs> years later, so. <laughs> okay. I, 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 somebody's going to have hell to pay. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess then that um, applies as well to, Swap.com being selected as the first one to air. That's the mm. Ernie Morton episode. Uh, yeah, something like that. I, I, anyway, the cre- the creative piece, it's all, you know, we're it's delivering. Network, so. Yeah, we're delivering a product. The product, yeah. the network has ordered 22 episodes. They're free to do with them what they want. Who decided to go with the, like, jazzy swing music for the series? Because it's perfect. It, it goes perfectly with the feel of the show and also mm-hmm. why a, why a claymation intro uh the ja- the music just uh, i mean all of those things were just like you have 700 meetings and you sit there and talk about it and i don't remember the details of the conversation that led to claymation um or the where we ended up but i agree with you i think that it sort of worked in a way mm-hmm. um but it, you know when you're creating a show, the, those things are talked about ad infinitum. And uh, I mean, because you're honestly on those decisions, you're sort of blue skying it. You're going, what about a reggae vibe? What about a so and so? And really, it's just you're just reacting. And, th- and you hire a, a composer, I think it was John Coda, and he's mm-hmm. p- pitching you 10 different, you know, the reggae version, that so and so version, that so and so version. And then you just go, finally, you just go, everybody likes this. And and it's like there's 20 people involved in that decision, Mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Not just that, you know, everybody on the network side and then some creative people. And so it's a a big uh, decision. Yeah, I think the the jazz music kind of makes it the show even more timeless because a lot of shows around that time were using uh, very uh, appropriate music for that era. 
you know, that whether it be like kind of like alternative rock or yeah, yeah, like hip, yeah. hip hop or something like that. But because it was jazz, it kind of had like that classical feel to it. And so it, like you watch it now and it doesn't feel dated when you watch the intro or when you uh, listen to even the back of the score, you know. So I think that really uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, helps it out there, too. Yeah, I, I, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it like that, but I, I think it uh, I think you're right. Oh, well, kind of going back just a little bit. Um, no agenda here. Let's just whatever <laughs> comes up, we can have a, You can just ask me to. You can ask me anything. Okay. Um, so, as far as like writing for Lewis Stevens, at a certain point, did you ever start sort of writing the character around Shia? Because there are some similarities um, as far as like like did you want to become a comedian or like is that part of your life or because I know at least, you know, Shia did stand up comedy and yes. that was part of who he was. And then there's also like a small little detail about, you know, like the family being, um, I seemingly half Jewish, half Christian, which is also, I, I think, um, part of, part of Shia's life. So like, was there like anything like that? Um, where you were like, yeah, like, let's, let's try to, um, build it around this kid. No, no, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, maybe the, there's a heck of the Hanukkah. I think maybe that was could have been inspired, you know, but we had some Jewish guys on uh, Dennis Rinsler and a couple of, I guess, Mark. And so, there, were, you know, people you're sitting in a room and it's December 1st and <laughs> you're like, going, hey, let's write a Christmas episode. Or the network has said, let's write a Christmas episode. And then the logical extension of that conversation is. In Lewis's heritage, and then you go, okay, this hasn't been examined and stuff like that. So you just start down that road. But um, yeah, I did. There was a minor obsession with comedians for me when I was a, a kid, and I remember that um, this is sort of uh, somewhat anecdotal. Like, but I remember when I was Lewis's age, for Christmas, I wanted a uh, tape recorder. And the reason I wanted a tape recorder is so I could look in my TV guide and see which comedians were coming up on Johnny Carson, Mike mm -hmm. Douglas, Merv Griffin, Dinah Shore, all the talk shows, right? And then I would, so I would know like at four o'clock on Thursday, uh, George Carlin is going to be on Mike Douglas. Mm -hmm. And so almost every day those talk shows would have, a, you know, a new young comedian on. And so I take my recorder and put it in front of the television and take the guy's routine. So I had a uh, library of stand-up, you know, this is the days of, like, you had a record. You, you could get comedy albums. You could get Bill Cosby. You could get uh, uh, Cheech and Chong. You could get Carlin. You could get, you know, there wasn't a lot of access to comedians. So, But I personally had everybody's routine, and I spent... And so what I would do is I would memorize their routine, and then the next day at school, I would sort of fold the, the, my new material into just abnormal conversations. And, <laughs> you know, the teacher would be like, it, you know, okay, guys, put your stuff where it's almost time for lunch. Lunch, you know, you think you got to, you know, what I got my lunch today, I got Swedish meatballs. They're just regular meatballs with blonde hair in them. <laughs> <laughs> and kids would be looking around and... Uh, They'd be that's going, great. God, that's weird. Like, I, I think for there's about a three year period where I didn't actually say anything that I felt like I was <laughs> working to regurgitate somebody else's jokes into uh -huh. <laughs> my thing. So, and that's what I do with Lewis Stevens today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I that, regurgitate that's what I those jokes Lewis, yeah. all the I time. Know. Tell me about it. So, who, who are your top three favorite comedians of all time? Stand ups or not? Or well, I've always liked. Uh, I, I've always liked this guy named George Miller. I do know George Miller, yeah. Yeah. He used to be on Letterman uh, every so often. He, yeah, yeah Letter, Letterman loved him. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, Steve Martin was important when he's he w was first on the scene. I'm not up, I mean, I live like a, a, a hundred yards from the Laugh Factory, so I'm so I'm out, I'm out of the comedy loop these days. Yeah. Uh, I saw Dana Carvey the other night, always funny. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know. All of them. That was a big time for a stand-up, like, I mean, in, the, like, 80s, 70s, 80s. Like, it was really huge. Yeah, yeah. I did I did stand-up at 
I, so I'm from Northern California. So I did stand up as a, like a 18, 19 year old at, in San Francisco at the boarding oh, house, cool. at the Holy City Zoo and stuff like that, which is, um, so it would be, that would be mid seventies, like seventy wow. seventy eight. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I was terrible. I mean, I, I wasn't terrible. I just, I, I just, uh, didn't like it. I just, mm-hmm. I, it was too emotional, too stressful. Yeah, so then I became a truck driver. (laughs) (laughs) That's cool, though. I didn't know that. Not many people know that, to be honest. I think this is the first time I've ever admitted it. We get the exclusive. Cool. Get that exclusive. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so there is a there are a few questions um, scattered in here from our followers that I, you know, obviously wanted to include. So the first one here is: Where did the character of Beans come from? Uh, and was he already created or did Stephen Anthony Lawrence play a part in his creation? That is from Christine, Angela, and Patricia from Manila. You know, Beans is one of my favorite, uh, one of the most amazing things that's ever happened to me in 30 years of show business. He came in and he was so unbelievably bad that we just thought, like, <laughs> this is, okay, this is weird. And, um, and he told this joke. I'm sure you've heard this story. He had this like classically structured like pirates joke about like Oh my god. Do you know this story? Oh yeah, yeah. I I no, heard this it's story. In, it's in the episode though. I don't know the story though. Oh it's yeah. Great- it's like and it and it had something to do with like so the first pirate you know, says you know, something and it was a rocking and a rolling and and the thing fell off. And the second day the sea was rocking and a rolling and he uh, you know, so he does the audition. He goes, "Hey, you guys want me to tell me?" To, as he's walking at the door, he's like, turns back. You want to hear a joke? And we're like, uh, "Anything to get you out of the room." So he tells his joke, and it was this joke. And then he leaves. And then we see like fourteen other people. And then we're going, "Okay, we've decided on like actor X." And literally, like it felt like as if we we're about to just go um, sign that. You know, tell call Disney and say we found our guy. We're going. What about that? What about that weird kid? Is that, is that, a, is, should we think about that? Like, and then suddenly it just like wildfire caught fire and suddenly like, what? No, let's do that. Let's do that. You know, <laughs> let's hide that kid. And then so obviously writing for beans was a challenge because he, um, not big on memorizing lines or getting through lines. So, you know, we had to write short stuff, but man, it was, it was hysterical, and uh, I came up with the idea that he was completely obsessed with bacon because what guy is in at that age or any age, and you know, then we were sort of good to go in terms of his character. Like it just made perfect sense. A weird kid who likes bacon. We're good to go. <laughs> That's it. That's so great. Yeah, because really, if you think about beans and his the the rules surrounding beans, as opposed to everybody else. There's a certain logic to beans or, or a certain absurdity to beans. Like he could just be in a cupboard. You'd open a cupboard and he'd be going, what are you doing in there, beans? I just, you know, eating bacon or something like that. Whereas everybody else sort of lived in a real, uh, more real world. Yeah. And I, I loved his relationship uh, with Lewis, how he kind of finally gave somebody who could really look up to Lewis and uh, kind of saw Lewis for... Like, he saw Lewis as, like, a celebrity in his mind. You know what I mean? And that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And why the name Beans? Like, where did that come from? We just we just needed a... Um, I, I, again, that was... Uh, we just needed something that was not, you know, Kevin or Blake or <laughs> something. It just... We knew Broad Character needed a, a suitable name. Mm-hmm. Hmm. You know what his last name was? His Aaron original Aaron. last name? No. You got it. Aaron Garen. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, but that's his name. Yeah. 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 Oh, I did. I did. I didn't know if you were giving us an exclusive of like a, 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 like an original last name and then it changed or something. I didn't know if everybody knew about Aaron Garen because that oh, yeah. was that was a Disney executive. Oh okay. Oh, okay. I didn't know. Oh, yeah. That. Bernard right. Beans Aaron Garen. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Do you ever go back and and watch episodes or or anything like that? A uh, few and not not really not too yeah. much. Um, you know, you're, you, you've been sort of rattling through a few uh, titles, so I'm going, what happened in that one? You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. stuff like that. So, I mean, I every time I do, I have a 
generally very positive vibes about it. Um, some of the ones I remember, rem the ones that I directed, I definitely can remember nuances and details and things like that. Um, and then the ones I wrote, you know, obviously you spend a little more time with, but there's a couple where I'm just, you know, I've, I've seen them a couple of times, but years ago, and I, I vaguely remember. Do you have any favorites? You know, I like the kiss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good one. I like strictly ballroom. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one too. <laughs> I've, both of those made our top, uh, my top ten. I, I don't know about yours, Brittany, but oh yeah, because we've if you don't know, we've both ranked all of the episodes. We both have our own lists, which is where the ranked comes from in the title. Our lists are kind of uh, contrasting a little bit, so it's it's interesting to talk about. Yeah, uh, but we're pretty. Uh, we agree with both of those episodes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. Um, I like Devil Mountain too. I mean, that's that's probably a little more buried in your thing, but it was just fun to get Christy and and um, uh, Tom, yeah. Tom get working out, working together on the side of a hill. And it was just funny. You know, that's a, that's the other thing. It's a very deep. What I would call it's a very deep cast. Like if you were thinking sports, like we have a deep bench. Like Tom Virtue is a is a killer. You know, he is just. Funny as hell. Yep. And, you know, Donna was great. There was laughs to get with Donnie Stevens. There was laughs mm -hmm. to get with Rabalski. There was laughs. To get. So it's like as a as a, a writer, a comedy writer, you're looking like sometimes you, you're in a character and you're going, "How do I make this guy funny?" Yeah. But but on this cast in particular, you knew exactly how to write for him. So if you do, you, you, were, you could really sink your teeth into a scene with, you know, Ren and Tom Grabowski. Um, you could sit, you sink your teeth into a Donnie bean scene. You know, you knew there was going to be funny there somewhere. Yeah. So that kind of goes into this next question that was asked by Logan Ford. Um, he asks, how long did it take to film an episode? And did people, did like the cast break constantly and like laugh? And then I want to know if there is a blooper reel that will ever see the light of day. If there's a blooper reel, I don't know about it. But there was, be, yeah, being on set was very easy. There was a lot of, the vibe was just amazing. It was like, no, nobody was tripping. Nobody was stressing. I mean, TV sets can get a little... You know, for whatever reason, personality, schedules, time, kid time. Um, but this was not like this. I think pretty much I, this is going to sound like a lofty statement for most of the people that worked on the show. I bet if you asked them what was your favorite show business experience, and I'm talking about crew and cast and writers, they'd say that show. Just because it was like, you kind of really like, it'd be a Thursday and you'd go, what it, is there, there's never a day where you're like, God, I'd rather go to the beach than go to work. You go, no, I don't to go to, let's go hang out down there. It's fun, you know? That's awesome. Yeah, it was a really good, good vibe. And I think that definitely shines through because there is this intangible, like, magic to the show that you don't really see in any other like shows that I've revisited from my childhood, this is like the only one that truly like really stands up and that I cannot feel weird about uh, still liking into adulthood. I, I totally know what you mean. And that's been my, as I've moved forward in my career, like that's what I realized is, is it the, the intangible ingredient. If people, I mean, you can still make a bad show and people are having a nice time, but when it's all coming together, I think that those intangible things that, you know, the love, the happiness, the, the, the spirit, it does, it does start showing up on screen. Mm -hmm. you, you know, even amongst actors, which is a super rare thing, you know, like most, most makeup trailers have a little, a little, push and pull, you know, going on with personalities and stuff, but everybody was, was super supportive and it was a real team effort, not unlike the Golden State Warriors. Up top! <laughs> Is that a Warriors hat you're wearing? Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, my, my parents, my family has had season tickets for 15 years. We were like diehards. Are you Warriors or Kings? Warriors? Uh, Warriors, yeah. All right, cool. But let's not hijack the uh, podcast. <laughs> uh, 
stay on point. So from what you remember, uh, do you have a favorite season out of the three? And like, was season one your vision you had? And then, or did it really not take shape until season three? Or like, what? where do you think is like the sweet spot? This is just, I, I, for whatever reason, this feels like a truism for me that I feel like any show, doesn't really figure itself out till about episode eight, nine, ten, eleven. Any show. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's a little different now in an age of Netflix, where there or, or uh, binge watching, where you do need to. You're telling a horizontal storyline, and so all the episodes are written before you start shooting. So you've had the time to go. This is what it is. But when you're doing episodic shows and you're sort of each one is a new pilot and you're going, what's working, who's funny, stuff like that, you don't you don't really kind of get comfortable to about episode nine or ten anyway. I, having said that, I would say I'd say by the end of the first season, everybody, crew, cast and writers knew exactly what the show was. I think there was a, still a few clunkers early on. Um in season one, um, but by by the late teens, early twenties, I think we we're good to go and rode that out the rest of the way. I mean, mm -hmm. we could have kept going. It, it didn't, you know. A lot of times you work on a show and you kind of go, I think, I, think we're, I think we're out of stories. But that that one was like. Uh, it was not difficult to come up with things. That definitely goes right yeah. into this next question here, um, which was, how did you feel about, you know, Disney's old 65 episode limit? And, um, you know, are you upset at all that it was cut after three seasons? Or is there anything else you wish you could have told? There was a little chit chat going on about maybe moving it to ABC. They were going to relaunch some sort of Friday night uh, TGIF thing and something like that. But, uh, you know, I mean, this is show business. This is full of misery and heartache and stuff like that. So you don't get too, I wasn't like, quote, bummed about it or pissed off about it or that's not that's not how I approach these things I, I'm always expecting <laughs> disappointment so I'm like yeah all right what do, now now what mm -hmm. Hmm. where do you think where do you think the show might have gone uh, if, if it went to a fourth season like what like uh, story wise that's a good question I, I don't remember um, yeah I, I don't honestly I would either have to go back and look at my notes which don't exist or I would have to uh, apply my I'd have to rewatch I mean I'm sure would have we would have figured something out but mm -hmm. I, but, it, but it actually goes to what I was saying earlier about how when you have a deep cast, there's all sorts of relationships that you can open up, you know. Um, so there's all sorts of dynamics to play and things like that. The, sh the show really changed over the course of the three seasons. Like season one was like a little rougher, like as you probably said, you know. Season one's my favorite season, though, because it's a little um, it's a little drier. It's a little... Um, you know, more subtle. The humor is not like on the nose. There's not a lot of physical comedy in the first season. And that's something that I really like about it. And then the second season got a little zanier. And then uh -huh. a lot of things in season three, especially the back end of season three, it was like, anything goes now. It's kind of seems like, so I guess that's kind of what we meant by uh, the direction you might have gone for a fourth season. Yeah, I, you know, I've never really looked at it like that. I think, you know, as I've said, like the original pilot was was very grounded, so that makes sense to me that you've articulated it that way. That it, you know, felt so. We were if we were sort of moving the away from that original pilot into. I, I now I get why you're saying like season one. So they were pro we were probably play, paying allegiance to where it started. And then uh, we were just sort of flexing our muscles as we went on and seeing what we could get away with and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, second season is my favorite. Uh -huh. Yeah, usually, usually second season of a show is pretty good because, you know, there's a freshness. The, 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 the stories you most want to tell because it's, you know, there's a comfort and it's stuff like that. And then, you know, a subsequent season – seasons you're sort of taking supplementary ideas that were like you know probably kicked off the board in season two 
said, oh, let's do that next season. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what, what is your favorite episode? Oh, um, yeah, well we, both, well, we both definitely have one because we both have lists. <laughs> mine is A Secret World of Girls. That's what I have for number one. And then I think you had that as two, right? Yeah, that's On my number list. two. Yeah. But I did that mainly because I know it's a very popular episode because uh, I was trying to be very personal and objective with my list. But my favorite is Band on the Roof, uh-huh. mm-hmm. mainly because I love The Office and uh-huh. I, I love that mockumentary style humor. Uh, and that episode is, I mean, I know it was kind of like a parody of VH1 behind the music or something, yeah. uh, but it totally has that mockumentary feel. And I just think it's hilarious, like, especially within the world of that show with those characters, that style, I just think worked really well in that episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I I agree. That was a great episode. Yeah, Secret World of Girls, I remember watching that for the first time and it was, I was like, this kid Beans was just so funny and I couldn't stop laughing. And I was hoping that he'd come back for more episodes, and he did. And it's a perfect episode in, in my book. So, yeah, but you're, we're not stupid. Once we saw Beans in action, yeah. we knew we knew he was coming back. Oh yeah. <laughs> I also just want to say that that fourth season question was asked by a uh, co. I'm gonna butcher his username, Coman Pally Art on Instagram. Yeah, I think that's, so looks like that. Give him that shout out. So by far the most asked question on social media, though, when we said we were going to be interviewing you, um, was if you, you might not know anything about this, but figured we might as well ask, is the show, like, will the show ever get any streaming rights? And everyone wants to know if it'll ever be released on DVD um, or, or why it never was, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering... We're such a passionate fan base. I, it, to me, it's you know, it's a it's a bit of a mystery. But um, I would I wouldn't be surprised if it resurfaces in in this climate in some way. Um, so, but no, I, there's no plans that I know. Of. And honestly, they would if if they being the people that have the rights to it. I think that's the Disney Corporation. They're not going to run it by me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll find out the same time you you do. Oh wow! Yeah. Do you think we would get the actual original pilot, like a uh, uncut, on there? That's that's no. <laughs> that that's too far in the vault. It's too far in the vault. It's probably too far in the vault. That was a uh, yeah. I, I wonder if I have that anywhere. Anyway, I should look at that. Uh, <laughs> I, I I don't think they would because it was never uh, del- it was never really delivered as a show as i said yeah. we shot we shot that one where the Ferris wheel was happening and stuff like that yeah hmm. so i guess you know when we talked about it resurfacing and everything uh, since the current climate is we're in a very early uh, 2000s 90s nostalgia wave um, we're in reboot fever uh, every show known to man is practically getting a revival. So, you know, these are your characters that you created. And, you know, with all of this going on, have you ever thought about what they might be doing today? You know, the, a guy that I worked with on Even Stevens, Tom Burkhart, every 48 hours calls me and says, we should do a, re- a reboot of Even Stevens. Um, so I have thought about it a little bit. But we, we think that... Um, you know, what if Twitty and Ren had a baby? Oh, I no. said that. <laughs> I'm I'm pro Ren and Larry. Oh, Larry Beal, sure. Larry, see, yeah, by the way, when you're talking about a deep cast, Ty, Eric, Ty Hodges was like, that's another go-to comedy guy. So yeah. funny. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, Ren and Larry, I see that too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but whatever the, whatever the uh, their offspring would be, it would be, it would probably name it Lewis and it would probably be a reincarnation of Lewis. You know what I mean? And yeah. so yeah. that's your, that's your kid entry point. Oh, so do you mean like as a reboot, like just about them? Yeah. So, well, uh, you build, you can build out the world and yeah, yeah. you know, you get Christy Romano and AJ Trouth or, or Eric Ty Hodges to just be who they are. They're the parents now. And then you sort of, just redo the sh- <laughs> you just redo it you know you yeah. the same sensibility the same they've got this troubled kid named Lewis Jr and you know Shy comes on and does a cameo bada bing oh, yeah. bada boom so is that is that how you envision a reboot you would never want to bring it back and have it you know 
um, for like the people that grew up with it and like us seeing our favorite characters navigating adulthood and like, like an HBO. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I saw I saw an interview with Sean McNamara where he said uh, even Stevens coming back with Shia as Louis Stevens today would be like an HBO show would be like <laughs> totally because I would lo- I would die oh, to yeah. see something like that. I, I'd subscribe to HBO. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, about the highest compliment you could pay. I think. Um, no, that'd be hysterical for sure. Yeah, I was I was thinking you're a more meaning like if you put it back on the Disney space. But mm-hmm. yeah, a reboot now would be pretty of where they are now. Because I think I mean if you got that on either like a major network or like Netflix or a streaming site or something, I mean that would give like shows you know Modern Family stuff like that. That would give those shows a run for its money. Yeah, I I fully agree with you. Um, yeah. All right, let's make it happen. <laughs> Please. It starts here. Would you ever do like since even Stevens? Because this is how I feel. I'm, I'm getting getting all my feelings out there right now while I have you here, uh, getting my ideas on the table. Um, you know, even Stevens was. Um, it was so Shia and Christy, Lewis and Ren. Um, the idea for me of a reboot, not being really about that or like without one of them feels a little I don't want to say wrong but I mean it does feel a little bit like I don't know where I'm going with this question now I was just basically you I mean yeah so if it wasn't for Disney and you did in a perfect world everyone could come back right um yeah what would what would it well you guys already you guys already said it I think you're both on the same page like if you did an adult version that I mean you you would you would need um, you you have to play that brother sister dynamic, and so I mean it, it would all at that point become about getting the actors involved and and stuff like that, which is probably a little difficult. Yeah, mm-hmm. some would be easier than others to sign off on. Yeah, um, I mean, do you think Shia would ever go for it if it was that sort of show? Like like oh like we're it's going to be older, it's not going to be. You know, it's not going to be on Disney or whatever. It's going to be this thing. Like, like how? What, what do you think it would take to get him to sign on? I say it's very uh, it's slim. I mean, the guy's super busy, mm-hmm. you know. Not that we're all not busy with our lives and stuff like that. But uh, who knows? He, yeah. You know, right when – the one thing we, we know about Shia is you can't figure him out. Yeah. Like, he, he'll do what he wants to do and – the minute you think he'd never do it, he'll go, if this is what I'm all about, let's do this, let's do it tomorrow, I'm in, you know. So he's a wonderful, you know, I'm a, I'm very, you know, although we don't see each other much, um, we text frequently and, um, wow. you know, he's a beautiful, he's a beautiful guy who, you know, who is giving 100% every day of his life. He really is passionate about, like, finding out who he is and create stretching himself creatively. And it's a, there are so many easy roads that he could take that he doesn't take just because he, 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 I think he likes creative discomfort and, um, you know, where, whereas, you know, if you look at other people that are, you know, they have other issues. Like for instance, like my career is always about, I got to, kid I gotta feed you know what I mean so if I had to write a greeting call card for Hallmark and they would pay me a, a check I'd be yeah I'm all about it let's do it I'm all about get well soon where do I start you know what I mean like mm-hmm. so I, I didn't have the luxury of sort of sitting back and you know choosing how I wanted to express myself mm-hmm. but yeah. anyway huge hot I'm a huge uh, shy supporter oh of- yeah, he's my he's my favorite actor <laughs> of all time, and it it started with even Stevens, obviously. But uh, oh, yeah. yeah, I've I've followed him extremely closely through his career, and uh, everyone in my life will uh, attest to that. Um, mm-hmm. They all know me as the Shia LaBeouf guy. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. same though, same. You so, got a rela- you I, not to typecast, but you got a little Ren Stevens in you. Me. I'm just saying, oh, wow. the little sweater, the, <laughs> the, the, the hair. I don't know. You just feel kind of Rhenish right now. Oh wow! Yeah, I can see that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, <laughs> that's a big compliment today. 
Um, yeah. So what else is on our list here? I mean, there was one here about Shia's career, but I think... Yeah, you kind of covered that. We had one on here that said, if did you foresee Shia's career that he would go on to be, you know, maybe not, you know, a dramatic actor that he, you know, sort of became, but that he would go on to bigger and better things? I think that, I think it was pretty apparent. It was pretty apparent that, you know, he just... He was so comfortable, and so, you know, it, it was just apparent that, you know, some if you hang around in Hollywood a, a lot, there's a few people you meet that just, you sort of get why they're good at what they do, and he was definitely one of them, you know, mm-hmm. definitely one that the, the camera went on, and then he became this, this had this unusual magnetism, mm-hmm. and, and it's nothing you can teach, you can't, you can't, send an actor to charisma class and after eight weeks they'll come out and suddenly you're glued to the, yeah. the set. I'm, st- I'm still waiting for another uh, Shia LaBeouf comedy movie. Oh, oh God, I yes. I see it so badly. Yeah, I've, I've talked to his manager about that and they're looking for it too. <gasps> they, but for years, but for years. I, yeah, yeah. It has to be the right one, you know? It has to be, yeah. it has to be smart, in my opinion. Like, I'd, I'd love to see him in that vein again they're they've been looking for for years and years and i've been hearing little rumors here and there but they're never they never amount to anything Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. getting movies made is difficult anyway and then so um but i i get it because i mean this is my own personal theory on on uh, actors and things like that is that Actors tend to take the blame for a failed comedy where they don't take the blame for a failed drama. Mm -hmm. Um, Nothing sort of puts them out for public scrutiny more than a bad joke. Mm -hmm. And not that Hot Shy couldn't make something funny, but I get why the risk is far greater than doing that than doing Transformers 3. You know, that's kind of a safe road and, you know. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, I think that's smart on their the, his management's behalf and his own behalf. And I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say Shy is running from you know like I'm not doing comedy. I think he's super open to it. Um, yeah, because <laughs> I know I personally would be so interested, specifically, of course, seeing how he would approach playing a thirty-something Louis Stevens. Like what that would look like. Like that is just amazing to me. I can't even. I would pay everything I have to see what that would be like. Oh, man, that'd be great. Like, that seems like an acting challenge, in my opinion. Like, I don't know how you would update it, but keep those quirks. And, and, you know, I don't know. That's just... Let me ask you this. Since you guys are developing this movie together, (laughs) is it what is it rated? I think if you could tell me what it's rated. I'd say PG-13. That's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nothing... Yeah, we're not going, you know... R ridiculous territory, but you know, just enough. Because there is an R version. Oh, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like, I mean, you guys brought up HBO and Netflix. And stuff <laughs> yeah. Like that. So it's like, you know, how how far do you want to push it? Yeah, you could do anything with those outlets. So. Yeah. I, yeah. So let's just call it PG thirteen. All right, I'll, I'll get to work on it. All right. <laughs> I'm excited now. Yeah, I'm excited now. Get our two cents in today. <laughs> Were you ever in any of the episodes? Like background or anything like that? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think I ever was. Which is... I, I guess I should be more... Whatever. But I'm not. Huh. Just curious. Yeah. I mean, a lot, a lot of time. I mean, it, it's not a... I mean, most of the time, if you're on a show for a while, they'll say hey go downstairs they're filming this thing you can be the janitor or something like that yeah i have one last kind of specific question i don't know if you'll remember this character his name was lefkowitz and he was just big red afro hair and he was just he never really had any speaking parts but he was in maybe five or six different scenes I'm right saying, what what was what was that all about i, I, I <laughs> what loved, was that about? i love the character but it was just so random and i can't find like credits on this character anywhere and right it was just kind of one of those things yeah it's kind of featured extra part you know yeah. non, non-speaking i mean in, in any school-based show you want to um so usually the extras process is every day you know you're doing a classroom scene people have gotten a call and then you um 
you show up on the day and go, oh, these are my kids, and then it's a random group every time, and some are better than others. But sometimes, I think in Lefkowitz's case, we saw a kid who looked great, yeah. and we, we told our ADs, like, any time we do a classroom scene, we, you know, we want to make sure this kid's here. And so he just sort of took on a life of his own. And, you know, yeah. the name like Lefkowitz, that's almost a punchline to a joke, you know, <laughs> by itself. <laughs> I think it was the punchline to a joke, actually. Yeah, he was. It was almost like a. It was almost like an in joke within the show, where kind of the characters would say, "Oh, hey, Lefkowitz," or "Sorry, Lefkowitz," and like only people who I feel like watched the show as obsessively as you know, as the, we do, the, yeah. as we do, kind of caught on to that. But um. I think uh, my so-called life. I don't know where that fits in the. The thing I think they had a character that ha- uh, existed off screen. T- Timo, right? Or was it Timo? Was yeah, it? Timo, something like that. Yeah, they all. He was like the band leader, but he would never showed up or something like that. Yeah, yeah, same kind of thing. I love stuff like that. Little Easter eggs. I think that's almost think that's all, all the questions, the questions that, on that here. Have, yeah. My God. You can feel free to call me with follow ups or yeah. just yeah, sure. if you're just lonely because I got nothing going. <laughs> I got a dog and I got I got you know espresso and other than that it's a very solitary existence so this has been the highlight of my week awesome oh it's been the highlight of our year oh, man a yeah, hundred percent the highlight of my week yeah thank All you right. so so much for this yeah. like, i really can't thank you enough this is an amazing first interview to sort of just get everything out there and just learn so much more about the show it's just been mm-hmm. so awesome to have you yeah sure my pleasure Let's do it again soon. Yeah. Yes, Definitely. for sure. <laughs> All right. See you guys. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 So that was our interview with series creator Matt Dearborn. Oh, God. We think that that went amazingly uh, we're so excited about this. We learned so many new things, I think, about the show. Yeah. And just hearing his perspective on a lot of it was really enlightening. Um, this is amazing. I'm I'm so excited about this and moving forward from here. I mean, your thoughts, Ethan. How was this uh, for you? I was starstruck pretty much the whole time. Um, but he's such a down-to-earth guy that, you know, I, it, after a while, it just became like talking to someone that you knew, you know. He's... Mm-hmm. Uh, Really good guy. I'm glad we got to talk to him. Oh, yeah. This was amazing. Um, and, and I'm excited for uh, maybe in the future another a follow-up, you know? Oh, That'd yeah. Cool. No, definitely later on Like the on more episodes the we get into, we'll think of more. Uh, we'll have more questions with that in mind, you know? So mm-hmm. that'd be cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, for sure. Because we obviously, this is something we want to keep going. And we have a lot to talk about. And, uh, mm-hmm. and it's, yeah, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be so fun moving forward with this. I never yeah. thought that I would ever be able to sit down and, and talk to the creator of my favorite show, you know, with the internet and just everything. And it's, it's just, unreal. It, it's so crazy. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I hope he finds the, the origin of Lewis's name. Oh yeah, I know. That's that's the follow up question. That's the follow up. <laughs> I'm dying. Just, I, I was like, oh man, I really want to know. But the one okay. question. The one question. He's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like, this is the question I want to ask. I even, I was even telling my son. I mean, he doesn't really understand what I'm saying yet. He's only six months old. But I was like, all right, I'm gonna ask. Daddy's gonna ask the creator of Even Stevens where the origin of Lewis came from and all this stuff. But he said he'll get back to me. So. We'll see <laughs> yep, maybe we'll, yep. uh, we'll we'll tell the listeners so That'd oh yeah cool. oh man but yeah so this was incredible guys i hope you've enjoyed uh listening as much as we've enjoyed sitting here interviewing him it was such a great Heck great yeah. great thing oh my god i'm so excited about this um so yeah guys for anything else uh any other cast and crew interviews that may be in the works here uh you know get in any thoughts any questions like we said before our our mailbox is always open just send whatever you want whenever you want um and yeah, follow, of course, as usual, on all the socials at Even Stevens Ranked, evenstevensranked.com. Uh, you know, we're all over the place and uh, we are here for this show. Um, yep. 10,000%. That is what we are doing with our time. Uh, we are <laughs> we are preserving the legacy of this show. Um, and yeah, I think this interview really just helped me uh, even realize even more how important this show is to me and how important it is in general, you know? Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, hearing his thoughts about it and how it actually was and, and you know, the feelings of being on set and how special he said that was, um, you know, that just made me be like, yeah, man, you know, this was like a really special show. And he also validated me um, for not feeling weird about being a fan of it into adulthood. <laughs> he said, yes, I, I, oh, yeah. I completely understand. And I'm like, yes, thank you. That is what I will tell now all my friends who judge me. Um, yeah. You know what? The creator said that I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's high praise. Right there. I mean, <laughs> but yeah, so I guess that's it for us today, guys. So yeah. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you in the next episode. See ya.